The Journey to Jerusalem The Disciples' Assignment The Borrowed Donkey The Arrival of Jesus This is Palm Sunday The Crowded Streets The Cloaks and Branches The Singing Children The Shouts of Praise This is Palm Sunday the people's questions, the prophecies fulfilled, the triumphal entry, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is Palm Sunday. The way of the donkey, the way of humility, the way of Jesus, the King of Kings. This is Palm Sunday. Good morning, Grace Point. It's so good to have you here with us today. Thanks for joining with us. And those of you who are joining with us online, thank you. We trust that the Lord will bless you and encourage you as we spend this time together. Well, today is Palm Sunday, and this marks, of course, the beginning of Holy Week, Passion Week. And I'm so glad that uh, you're here as we begin thinking and meditating and reflecting upon the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to join us on Friday. Friday we have our Good Friday service. It'll be a communion service and we'll be focusing on the atoning death of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we'll be thinking about the significance of that sacrifice uh, as it relates to our lives today. And then I hope that you'll be back with us, Lord willing, next Sunday for Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. We'll be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and talking about how his resurrection can impact our lives today. And uh, we'll be reflecting on that relevancy. And so I hope that you'll be with us next Sunday for our Easter Sunday service. It's so good to have Alan and Allison with us today. Um, they are just a wonderful couple who love the Lord deeply and have uh, just had such a faithful and effective ministry. You just heard little snapshots in the, uh, in the presentation, but there's so much more. And one of the great blessings I've had is when they are back in town uh, over these years, so they've been at it for 40-plus years, I've been here for 31 years, uh, and when they've been back uh, in town, uh, we will get together for lunch, and uh, I just have really appreciated their spirit of service and the way that they have approached their ministry and continue to approach their ministry. And for us, what a privilege it has been for us here at Grace Point to partner with them for this, uh, this long tenure of service. What a blessing that has been. So good to have you with us. Thanks for being with us and sharing with us. I'm really looking forward, Debbie and I are looking forward to joining a bunch of you uh, for lunch today downstairs after our service is over where we'll be celebrating uh, the Dixon's 40 plus years of ministry and so I'm anticipating we'll have a wonderful time together. Well this morning we're going to continue our current study in the Old Testament book of Exodus and we come to the moment when Moses finally takes a road trip back to Egypt. You might recall that over the last number of weeks we've been looking at the whole setup for our Moses going back to Egypt and the fact that initially Moses was none too thrilled about being tapped on the shoulder by the Lord for the role of rescuer of God's people from the Egyptian bondage that they were being uh, held under by Pharaoh and he had pushed back big time and we have talked about that over the last few weeks against the whole idea of him doing it Lord you got the wrong guy I'm not the right guy and yet finally uh, the Lord, as he works in Moses' life and uh, reassures Moses of the fact that he would be with him, finally, after he runs out of excuses, Moses relents and, okay, I'm going to head to Egypt. And so uh, it's Egypt or bust. And so we pick up the story today uh, in a Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. If you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to take it and turn to that text, Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Last Sunday, we considered the fact that like Moses, those of us in Christ have also been called by God to serve. First of all, though, we have been called to God 
in salvation. That through the work of the Holy Spirit, God has called us, who are his own, into a living, transformative, eternal relationship with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that we have been so privileged to have been called into a relationship with our Lord and Savior. But those to whom God has extended that call, those are also individuals who are called to serve. We talked last Sunday about the fact that we've been saved to serve. We are those who, by the grace of God, have come into relationship with our Creator. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been restored and reconciled to that relationship. And now we have been sent out. We have been saved to serve. And so, like Moses, we have a call of God on our lives. Every single one of us here who are in Christ, you have been called of God to serve Him in various ways. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. We who are in Christ have this great, great privilege to not only have been personally saved through faith, but also to have been called by God to serve him and others wholeheartedly with our lives. Like Moses of old, we've received, one might say, a high calling, a high calling indeed that requires from each of us a focused commitment. And that's what we want to talk about this morning, the focused commitment that we need to bring to the service that God has called us to, whatever that may be in particular in its expression in your life. And it seems to me that in our text this morning, we find uh, really a number of distinctive features of just such a commitment. What does it look like For one who is in Christ to serve God, what are some of the distinctive features of that person? Now, there's a lot more that can be said about this than what we're going to see in our text today, but I want to highlight three distinctive features that I think we see in this text with regards to those who are called to serve, that are to mark our lives. And so as we go through each of these, if you're in Christ, I want you to think about, okay, is that reflective of my life? Does that... um, Does that feature, does that characteristic uh, find expression in my service to the Lord? And we'll walk through them together. It seems to me that in our text this morning, we find this sort of profile, and it begins in Exodus chapter 4, verse 18 to 20, which reads as follows. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hands. You know, it's one thing uh, to be hesitant to confront the king of Egypt um, with news that he doesn't want to hear. It's another matter altogether to have to go and tell your father-in-law, I'm taking your daughter and your grandchildren far away, and we may never be back. I'm not sure which is more intimidating, you know, going to Pharaoh and telling him the bad news, or having to go to your father-in-law in that culture, in that time, and saying, hey, we're leaving. Um, we're not sure if we'll be back uh, ever again. However, our text opens with Moses doing exactly that, which is a necessary step within that ancient culture where it would have been expected that the father-in-law, whose home you had been living in for the last 40 years, that you would speak to your father-in-law and ask for his permission before just upping and leaving. And so Moses does that. And though Moses doesn't mention to Jethro his dramatic encounter with God in the wilderness, his request does demonstrate that he finally has come to grips with the fact that he is God's man for the role that God has called him to. Even though initially he had been so reluctant, we see here that, okay, he's come to accept that. He's come to accept his call, and he is on his way back to Egypt. I want you to take special note at the end of verse 20, where it says, Moses took the staff of God in his hand. 
um, in setting off for Egypt, not only did Moses take with him his wife named Zipporah, along with their two sons, Gershon and Eliezer, but he also took with him his staff. As you may recall earlier from a previous study, the first three miraculous signs that God gave to uh, Moses to assure him of his presence, um, the first of those three signs was this staff, which was Moses' staff as a shepherd. And you may recall that God had him throw down the staff onto the ground, and then when he did that, it turned into a snake. And remember, Moses was scared and he ran away. And the Lord said to him to take a hold of it, to take it by the tail, which you never do. Never pick up a snake by the tail. That's guaranteed you're going to get bit. But Moses trusts the Lord, and he picks up, he takes the snake by the tail, and it immediately turns back into his staff. Uh, this is the staff that we're talking about here. In obedience, when Moses reached out and took a hold of that snake with his hand, it was transformed back into a harmless staff. And this is a powerful, symbolic expression of the fact that as Moses was going to go back to Pharaoh, in all the power that Pharaoh represented of the great Egyptian kingdom and empire, and the fact that the cobra snake was the symbol of that power, and it was prominently featured in the center of the headdress of the Egyptian kings. That with God on his side, there was nothing to fear. Because just like when Moses would reach out and pick up that snake by the tail, it would immediately turn back into a harmless staff, God in his power was going to over, overwhelm the earthly power of Pharaoh. And he would be no threat in the end to Moses as Moses walked according to the will of God. And that's why it's appropriately designated in our text, notice, not as Moses' staff, but the staff of God. Something had changed. It had changed from being simply Moses' staff. Now it's the staff of God. It is the symbol of the power and the presence of God in Moses' life. And you may recall from last week that back in verse 17, when God says to Moses, now go, get on your way back to Egypt, he says to him, and don't forget to take the staff. Sort of like a parent, you know, when you as a teenager go on your first trip and, you know, you're, you're going to fly perhaps somewhere and your parent keeps saying, have you got your passport? Don't forget your passport. Have you got your passport? Right? This is what God says to Moses. Don't forget to take the staff, Moses. That's interesting. I would suggest to you that this underscores for us the first distinguishing mark from our text today of the life of one called by God, and that is they live in reliance upon God's Spirit. What did that staff represent? That staff represented the fact that God was present with Moses as he fulfilled his call, and that the power of God would affect the purposes of God through Moses' service. Even as Moses was to fulfill God's call in his life through an ongoing reliance on the presence and power of God's Spirit, likewise, those of us who are in Christ, who have been called by God to serve, are also to intentionally rely upon the indwelling power of the Spirit of God within as we seek to serve our Lord. The Bible teaches that when we first exercise trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God comes to spiritually live inside us through His Spirit, making our bodies His temple, His dwelling place. In this regard, writing to those in Christ living in the ancient city of Ephesus, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is a temple? of the Holy Spirit. When you came to Christ, when you, when you surrendered your life at the foot of the cross, 
and you embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior, God implanted his Spirit within you. The Spirit of God lives inside you. Your body, as it were, is the temple, the dwelling place of God. And one of the main purposes of the presence of God's Spirit with us as those in Christ is to provide us with the power necessary to live out our call, the calling that God has extended to us. God has implanted His Spirit within us, and He has done so in part so that we would be empowered to affect the call that God has extended to us. The indwelling Holy Spirit does this in a number of different ways. He empowers us, for example, to share with others the good news concerning Jesus Christ. He empowers us to serve the Lord and others through the exercise of spiritual gifts and abilities that God has given to each one of us. He empowers us to pray effectively even when we don't know what to pray. He empowers us by guiding and directing us in the decisions that we make, giving us the wisdom that we so desperately need. These are just a few of the ways that the indwelling Holy Spirit is such a gift from God to us in empowering us to live out the call that God has extended to us. And therefore, your life as one in Christ is to be characterized, my friends, not by a prideful self-reliance, but rather by a humble God-reliance. Those of us who are in Christ, who've been called to serve, and that's all of us who are in Christ, we need to realize that the Spirit of God indwells us so that He might guide us and empower us to carry out the calling that God has extended to us. And that means that we are to live lives that are to be marked by reliance upon that Spirit. Not by self-sufficiency. Not by a sense of, I can do everything myself. I don't need anybody's help. No, those of us who have been called, like Moses, we need to learn to rely upon the indwelling Holy Spirit within our lives to affect what God has called us to. If you're in Christ, not only have you been called to serve the Lord and others, but you have been clothed with power from on high to fulfill that service through the Spirit of God living within you. And the question I have for you at this point is this. Are you learning how to depend more fully upon the empowerment of the Spirit of God? Are you, living, are you learning as you live out your Christian life to live a more dependent life, a life that's more reliant upon the empowerment of God's Spirit within? Or are you still struggling with the sense of self-sufficiency, self-empowerment, the idea of a prideful approach to living out your Christian life. Our text in Exodus 4 tells us that when Moses and his family left their home in Midian to head to Egypt in accordance with God's call, Moses took the staff of God in his hand, the symbol of God's enabling power and presence for Moses to fulfill his call. He took the staff of God. He so desperately needed the power of God and the presence of God for the calling that he had received. We who are in Christ likewise need to increasingly and intentionally take hold of the enabling power of the Spirit of God living inside us in order to more effectively serve God and others as we abide in Christ. That's the first distinctive of the person who has been called to serve God, and that means all of us who are in Christ. Our lives should be marked by that kind of reliance upon the enabling power of the Spirit of God within us. I think this um, raises a second feature, though, of the life of one called by God in the next section of our text, beginning in Exodus 4, verse 21. There we read as follows, And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, 
Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, there's a whole series of very significant themes in that text right there, and we could take the next four weeks to look at all of them. For instance, um, the issue of God's sovereignty and human free will jumps out from this text, doesn't it? I mean, if God sovereignly hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he refused to let God's people leave Egypt, is Pharaoh really accountable to God for his having made those decisions? That's a good question, isn't it? Um, and we see that raised here in the text. Um, another question would be with regards to the issue of why would God approach his plan in this way, whereby he's sending Moses to deliver the people of God, his people, from Egypt, and yet he's telling Moses that he's going to harden the heart of Pharaoh not to be willing to do that. Uh, there's a, a number of good and important items there that we need to talk about. And as we move through the text in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at those things in more detail, especially as we get to chapters 7 to 11, where we see the plagues that come upon Egypt because of Pharaoh's resistance and the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. We'll talk about all of those matters then. But for our purpose today, I want you to notice the irony of the text. Moses has been called by the Lord to accomplish a task that God himself will initially thwart. Isn't that somewhat ironic? God is calling Moses to a task, to a job, but he's also telling Moses that, by the way, um, I'm also going to make that difficult for you. That seems to be somewhat ironic. Moses has been called by the Lord to accomplish a task that God is going to put roadblocks between, you know, the calling of Moses to accomplish the task and the accomplishment itself. Imagine yourself in Moses' sandals making the long trek to Egypt with your wife and two boys, thinking about how exactly you're going to confront Pharaoh with the Lord's command to set God's people free. What would you be praying about during that journey? I know what I'd be praying about. Okay, I've got my wife, I've got my two sons. I don't have any sons, I've got four girls. But anyway, two sons, um, and we're on our way back. I've got a lot of time to think, a lot of time to pray. I know that ahead of me is this enormous task to confront Pharaoh. I'm, I'm going to confront Pharaoh, okay. Uh, I'm going to tell him he needs to let God's people go. Lord, it would be so wonderful if you soften the heart of Pharaoh. Before I get there, Lord, it'd be so wonderful if you would work in his life and for some reason, maybe even unexplained reason, that when I get there and say, let my people go, speaking for you, Lord, that he would be ready for that and, and he would say, yeah, okay, I think that's a good idea. You go ahead. Isn't that what you'd be praying if you were in Moses' sandals heading to Egypt? That's what I'd be praying. Lord, soften the heart of Pharaoh, please, Lord. Work to soften his heart so that he will be receptive to this unwelcome message that I'm going to bring to him. But what actually happens is that while Moses is on the way to Egypt, God meets him and sticks a big old pin in that wishful balloon. And says, um, hey Moses, it's great to see you're finally on your way to Egypt. But there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet that I think you should know, and that's this. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not want to let my people go. The exact opposite of what I would have been praying for. Lord, soften the heart of Pharaoh. Please, Lord. Soften his heart so that he'll be responsive to the message that I'm bringing to him. And God says, um... I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to harden his heart. Seems to me this highlights for us a second distinguishing mark of the life of one called by God. They live to advance God's purposes, not their own. 
Moses was called by God to do a job, and his responsibility was obedience, not success. God alone is in control of the outcome, meaning that we, like Moses, are to be committed to being faithful to our calling. What is our job as it relates to God's call on our lives? It's not success. Success is God's part. It's faithfulness. It's being faithful to the call of God on our lives. It is being faithful to the mission that God has sent us to. Success, that's God's work. That's not my responsibility. That's God's work. I want to serve him so that his purposes are advanced, not my own. God alone is in control of the outcome, meaning that we, like Moses, are to be committed to being faithful. However, today we live in a success-obsessed culture where such thinking is nonsensical. You give yourself to pursuits to be successful, and faithfulness, diligence, and devotion alone must not be confused with success. Those may be valuable things, but that's not success. The bottom line is success. Imagine Moses trying to explain to Zipporah, his wife, that she'd left her father and her family behind in the rural outback where they lived and had a nice life in order to be relocated to the capital of the great power of Egypt to play a part in God's rescue mission for his people, only on the way to be told by Moses that God had let him know in advance that he was going to ensure that Pharaoh would not listen to him. That must have been an interesting conversation on the way to Egypt. Um, those of you who are married, have you ever found yourself in those situations? where you're maybe on a bit of a road trip with your spouse and there's an issue of conflict that arises, makes for a long, quiet journey, doesn't it? Zipporah, what? What did you just say? Imagine. Friends, like Moses, we who are in Christ have been called to the same difficult dynamic. Think about it. Part of the calling that we have all received from our Lord is to be a witness of him to others who are far from him. We have been, each of us who are in Christ, called to be a witness of the gospel to those who are far from God. And we are to share with them the gospel message, both showing it through the way we live our lives in relationship with them and telling them. It's a show-and-tell deal where we tell them when we have opportunity verbally about the love of Christ and what Christ can do in their lives. But whether they respond or not, that's not our responsibility. We have been called to be faithful to the task. Whether they respond or not, that's a God thing. That's not up to you and me. We've been told in Scripture that no one will come to the Father except if Christ draws them to the Father through the work of the Spirit. No one. No one is going to come to saving faith based solely on what you tell them or show them. It will not happen. You and I have a part to play in the dynamic, but closing the deal is not one of them. Only the Spirit of God can close the deal. Only the Spirit of God can lead a person who's far from God to see their need of Christ and humble themselves before the foot of the cross and receive Christ as their Savior. That's not your responsibility. And that should take some burden off your shoulders. You've been called to be a witness. God is responsible to work in their lives, to draw them to himself, if that is according to his will and his purpose. Our job is to be faithful. Same thing is true of every other type of calling that God extends to us. We're called to pursue God's purposes, not our own. 
Think of the prophets of old. How many of them proclaimed God's message faithfully, and yet they were killed for doing so? Would you call that a success? Not according to our standards today. That's a failure. But prophet after prophet after prophet, we see in the Old Testament, ended their lives by being killed for the message that they were bringing. Think of what the writer of the Hebrews tells us at the end of, the fa- of his famous Hall of Faith passage in Hebrews 11. If you want to be encouraged um, this afternoon, read those last part of Hebrews 11. There the writer says that some were tortured, mocked, and flogged. Others were imprisoned, stoned to death, or killed with the sto- sword. Still others were destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. Based on the prevailing definition of success, those people all failed. And yet God puts them in the hall of faith and says to Steve Webster, be like them. Be faithful. Be diligent to the call that I've extended to you. No matter what the price, no matter what the cost, be faithful. Leave the results up to me. You play the role that I've called you to play in the pursuit of fulfilling the purposes that I have. And is that your approach to living out your call, the call you've received from Christ? Is that how you approach it? Will you love when you're not being loved back? Will you forgive when the other person refuses to admit their guilt? Will you care for those who never ask you how you're doing? Will you give financially to those who always seem to be in financial need? Will you serve those who will never appreciate your efforts? God calls us to be faithful and leave the results up to him. Be faithful. I appreciate that wisdom and discernment are necessary ingredients to add into the process of reflecting on personal callings God has extended to each of us, but we need to be willing to commit ourselves to being obedient to God's call on our lives and above all else, to leave the results to Him. We are called to be faithful. Are you being faithful to the call that God has extended to you? Are you being faithful in it? Are you being diligent about it? In the confusion of not really knowing what God's doing, are you going to remain faithful and say, okay, God's looking after the results. I'm just called to live out my calling, to be a witness of his, to love others, to serve, etc. I would suggest to you a telltale indication that perhaps we're struggling with this distinctive is one is when we begin to think and act as if God owes us because of our service to him. In other words, we begin to see our obedience as a means to our own ends as opposed to his. And the result is that we can lose our grip on the reality of God's grace and begin viewing our relationship with God through the prism of our works. In other words, God, I've been so faithful to you, you now owe me. God, I've played my part. I've done what you have called me to do. You owe me now, God. All of a sudden, our relationship becomes about works. We've lost our grip on God's grace. And it so subtly can happen in all of our lives. When we come to believe that because we've done something for him that he now needs to do something for us, that is a pretty good sign that we're no longer committed to faithfully following God's purposes, but have rather begun confusing his purposes with my own. We need to be on guard against that. And that brings us to the third and final distinguishing mark from our text today of the life of one called by God. Yes, he or she lives in reliance upon God's Spirit and lives to advance God's purposes, but they also live respecting God's commands. Now, our text for this point is found in Exodus 4, verses 24 to 26. 
And I just want to tell you before we look at it, this is one of the strangest, weirdest passages in all of the Bible. Um, this is such a bizarre text that many, many pastors will not even preach it. And following today, I may discover why that is. Because I am going to take you to it. It is, a, it is a very strange text. And it is such a compact text that it raises all sorts of questions that we, we really don't have answers to. And in our course that corresponds to our series, um, when we next meet for our Exodus Compass course, we'll delve into some of those questions. We don't have time today to do that, but we'll delve deeper. So if you're ready, we'll take a look at this text in a moment. And um, hopefully that it will mean something to you by the time we finish. Beginning in verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, that's Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, the Lord, led him, Moses, alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. It seems perfectly clear to me. Fits right in. I don't even think I need to comment on it. It's so obvious what it means, right? What? You know, this week as I've been studying this text, I've been looking at this and just, what? And uh, so many different questions that I have. Moses is finally set off for Egypt in obedience to God's call in his life when at some point during that road trip, God somehow assaults him, leaving Moses seemingly incapacitated. The text says that God met Moses on the way and sought to put him to death. What? God had finally got Moses to move out in obedience after Moses had been pushing back against the call, and when he's on his way, God meets him to put him to death. Okay. And while Moses is seemingly incapacitated, we're not sure what exactly happened, whether he was stricken with some illness suddenly, or we don't know. But while he's kind of on the sidelines, his wife Zipporah springs into action. And what does she do? Well, circumcises her son, and in doing so, saves Moses' life. What? Uh, what do we make of this? Though it's a text replete with ambiguities, I think there's at least one thing that's clear. For whatever reason, Moses had not been faithful to the covenant the Lord had entered into with his people through Abraham. You see, back in Genesis 17, God made a covenant with Abraham, saying to him, listen, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Moses is part of that offspring. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He, uh, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. You didn't know you were coming to church to hear me talk about circumcision today, did you? Circumcision was the required marker that a Jewish male was part of God's covenant community. And as an act of obedience to the Lord, every Jewish father was to ensure that their sons were, act, were accordingly circumcised. It was a call of God. It was a mark of being part of the covenant community of faith. And every father was responsible to ensure that his son and sons were circumcised accordingly. However, despite this clear command of God, 
it appears that Moses had failed to circumcise one of his two boys. The question is why? Why? Why would Moses fail to do something that's very clear in the covenant relationship that God entered into with Abraham and Abraham's descendants? Perhaps it's because it was a rite that was not practiced among the Midianites, and Moses had therefore apathetically accommodated to the norms of that culture. Remember when Moses fled Egypt for his life, he ends up in Midian. He marries a Midianite woman, Zipporah, the one with the flint knife. By the way, if you ever see Zipporah coming at you, you better run. Um, he gets married. Different culture. Midianites were descendants from Abraham, but from Abraham's second wife. And perhaps they didn't practice circumcision. We just don't know. Some suggest they practiced circumcision as adults, not children. We're not sure. Maybe if that's the case, that Moses living there for 40 years, he just kind of apathetically acclimatizes himself to the norms of the Midianite culture. Or perhaps Zipporah had persuaded Moses not to circumcise their oldest son, Gershom, while he was still a child because it was distasteful to her. We don't really know because the text doesn't tell us. But what we do know is that his neglect, Moses' neglect, was an act of disobedience against God. For as the one who will deliver Israel, Moses must be personally committed to obey the commands of the covenant that lie at the center of the children of Israel being the very people of God. Here's Moses going to be the rescuer of God's chosen people who are in bondage in Egypt, and he's not even living out the commands of God that are at the core of the covenant relationship that make those people he's going to to liberate God's people. Do you see the problem? There's a problem here with integrity. There's an integrity issue here. Godly character, my friends, is ultimately more important to the Lord than our acts of service. As we talked about last Sunday, it's wonderfully true that God uses us despite our weaknesses and that he is strong when we are weak, but he's not unconcerned about our character and commitment to living out his commands. While it's true that God calls us to serve him and others, that calling is never to be an excuse to live morally compromised lives. And yet this can happen. We're so busy serving God, we're so committed to serving God, that we're cutting corners morally. That we're walking away from the truths that we're telling other people that they need to follow. Our developing lives of integrity and holiness is a first order of business for the Lord. And that's what Moses was lacking in regard to the matter of circumcision. And so then I want to ask you, do you ever confuse your good works, your service of God and others, with righteousness? Do you ever confuse your serving of God and others with righteousness and holiness? It can easily happen. Do you ever fall into the trap of thinking that as long as you're serving God and others, the Lord is not all that concerned about your character and your conduct? Never forget, my friends, that your evidencing the fruit of the Spirit in your life is always more important to the Lord than your using the gifts of the Spirit. God has called you to serve Him using the gifts of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, but never be confused by the fact that your character, your character is more important ultimately to God than your acts of service. He wants both. We're called to both. But character is most important. Being a godly man or woman, being a person who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, those things are at the top of the priority list. Yes, we're called to serve. Yes, we would be disobedient to God if we did not serve. 
but we're, to call, we're called to serve as those who are living out a life of righteousness and holiness and devotion to the Lord. So this morning we've sought to acknowledge three distinguishing marks of the life of one called by God, characteristics that should be prominent in your life if you are in Christ. First, you live in reliance upon God's Spirit. Is that true for you? Are you learning how to live in reliance upon the Spirit of God more and more each day? Surrendering control of your life, opening up all the doors in your life, and letting the Holy Spirit be sovereign and supreme in your life and empower you to live for Him. Second, you live to advance God's purposes. Is your agenda God's agenda, or do you have a hidden agenda in following God's agenda, which is what you want, what you think is most important, what you think should be the end result? Or are you willing to leave the results with God and be faithful, be faithful? Thirdly, you respect God's commands. You are a person who's devoted to that relationship with God of integrity, that your integrity is something that is core to who you are, that you are seeking more and more through the empowerment of the Spirit, guided by the Word of God, supported by the community of Christ, to become a Jesus first follower, that nothing is more important to you in your life than your love for Christ. Nothing. And your character evidences that. Can those things, those three things, be truthfully said of you? If so, give God thanks for the work of His grace in your life. If so, thank Him for His work in your life in this way. But if perhaps you're a little bit shaky on one or two of those, maybe even all three, lean in. Lean into these things, my friends. This is what God has called you to. Like Moses, be that person who is described by these distinctives. Someone who is reliable. Someone who is focused on God's purposes. Someone who lives out God's commands. You, my friend, have received a high calling from Christ. Don't for a moment ever think that you've not received a high calling. You have received a high calling. And it's to be lived out in reliance upon Him to the end of advancing His purposes while being committed to the practice of personal righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for the opportunity to, again, study Your Word today and to give thought to lessons for living that come from the life of Moses. And this morning, as we've again looked at Moses and we've seen his response to the call that you had placed upon his life, we see him taking the road trip, as it were, to Egypt. Even in those, those experiences, there are lessons for us to learn even though these things happened so long ago, they're so relevant to our lives today. And for those of us who know you and love you, Lord, we pray that you might impress upon us some of the truths of this text and lead us to make the changes that need to be made in your power to conform more fully to the type of servants that you have called. We want to be those who are marked by these distinctives. And so we pray that you will lead us and guide us as we leave this place in a few moments and that as we go through this coming week that we would be those who are faithful, reliable, God-honoring, those who are seeking your purpose, that your name would be exalted. We pray this in Jesus' name.